good evening all we are all assembled here for the 68th session of lex webinar series which was just started as a small uh, moment on 16th of april 2020 during the lockdown period we thought of making a small step so that uh, the younger members of the bar don't get without any direction or wasting their time but as time flies the webinar has become a movement and more and more people started showing interest and now we are having audience cutting across the barriers of the country and we have been very careful in choosing the resource persons and the topic of deliberation and at the end of the day whatever is deliberated the message should be in a position to convey a kind of lesson to the members of the bar so that they can apply it in their life and profession at any point of time with this award object we have crossed nearly 67 sessions so far and this is the first uh, session on indirect tax and we are delighted to have two uh, resource person here the first being to just is sri kartikeyan the speciality of him is something very unique he represents the sixth generation of a family of lawyers and judges to shri sri v simraj shastri and saraswati shastri he did his schooling at the joseph presentation convent rayapuram chennai and later he completed his high school from st mary's high secondary school armenian street chennai just opposite high court and higher secondary schooling from the hindu senior secondary school triple k in chennai graduated in bsc statistics from madras christian college tambaram and bl from dr ambedkar law college chennai and he didn't stop there later he also completed ml from annamalai university and again ma from madurai kamraj university he enrolled himself as an advocate on the 23rd august 1989 and joined the office of the doyen of the bar mr late v s subramanian and he was also practic part time professor of madras law college and he has established a commendable individual practice too and he has chosen to be a district judge directly in the tamil nadu state judicial service and joined the services on the 6th june of 2005 as a trainee judge at ramanadapuram he has served the tamil nadu state judiciary as second additional district judge cba cases madurai additional and principal labor court judge at vellur and more importantly he has held the post of director of tamil nadu state judicial academy and registrar vigilance madras high court and finally as the chief judge pondicherry during which period he also served intermittently as a member secretary puducherry legal services authority and then on 5 10 just cv kartigen has been elevated to the madras high court this is the travel of the march of the profession the cv kartigen has been holding and the second resource person we have today is a chartered accountant he is mr dwarakesh he graduated with a degree in commerce from university of madras in the year 2009 he is a chartered accountant company secretary and also a law graduate having a post graduation experience and almost for a decade currently he is practicing as a chartered accountant based in chennai he is a partner in dur and associates llp chartered accountants prior to stepping into the practice he has spent 5 years of post graduation career in big four chartered accountant firms in direct tax domain he specializes in the areas of international taxation transfer pricing corporate taxation and the gst mr dwarakesh has worked extensively with councils including senior councils on direct tax litigation matters before various forum including the high court authority for advance rulings apart from that he has made representation before the tax tribunal dispute resolution panel commissioner appeals and tax authorities on various routine and complex issues including international tax issues mr dwarakesh has contributed to articles on taxation and presented sessions conducted by icai and various forums this is introduction of this mr dwarakesh with this introduction let us move to the session may no request justice cv karthikeyan 
to comments this session sir you are welcome on the forum is yours sir yeah, thank you thank you very much mr srinivas raghavan and uh, i feel really deeply honored and humbled to be part of your uh, your webinar series lex webinar series which you've been now conducting for uh, such a long time successfully and uh, this is i think you said as the 68th of the such series yes sir and uh, it it does give uh, a sense of pride that uh, somebody from the madras bar has uh, really reached out to advocates and other professionals even during this very terrible situation which as a country and as a whole we are all facing and this gives uh, much food for thought and i must congratulate you and your team hemlata is also there on uh, organizing these uh, lex webinar series i hope we will be doing justice to the and to, to the expectation of the participants here and i also welcome and uh, appreciate the presence of mr s dwarakesh the chartered accountant i've had had a small brief uh, conversations with him and i readily found that uh, he is more knowledgeable on the subject than i am and uh, that gives a, a sense of security also because uh, it is always nice to have somebody who is at the field at all points of time uh, you know once we cross over to the bench the concept of reading it come uh, become shrunk it gets shrinked to what actually is the portfolio you hold and it takes some effort for uh, many of us to expand knowledge uh, other ways also but i had the opportunity of sit sitting with justice uh, dr vinit kotari and the participants here had appeared and uh, i think uh, all they would have known as a quiet person sitting without opening his mouth but uh, and uh, the then a senior judge was holding the fort uh, right through but it was a very revealing uh, experience and when uh, mr srinivas raghavan when you offered uh, and you invited me to be a part of this program there were various topics which went across and uh, i think you must also uh, know that uh, this was uh, totally not at all a subject which was there in the minds of uh, either one of us <laughs> then i centered down into income tax act and i thought uh, in income tax act this topic on uh, capital gains and the exemptions might be of some uh, use to all professionals to all work to people of all walks of life buying a house after selling a old house is always a dream and even otherwise buying uh, getting into this uh, concept of purchase and sales of uh, long term capital assets and short term capital assets have always been the object of anybody who sets out in life and makes a reasonable uh, profession or business out of it so with that in mind uh, i chose this topic and in fact first uh, if you remember mr srinivas raghavan i centered on uh, section 54 yes and then uh, when you had uh, uh, when you called me up over the telephone you expanded the range from section 45 onwards 40. yes sir actually the correct approach and shows your sharpness on it and uh, section 45 is the charging section and uh, from there onwards the particular chapter on capital gains moves forward up to section 55 55 so at the beginning uh, the ma manner in which i thought this program will be uh, where we'll be having this program is for me to give a brief overview of the various provisions of the law uh, and then uh, the to touch a little bit about the nitty gritties about uh, exemptions first we must know what is a capital asset and then we must determine whether it is a long term capital asset short term capital asset and then the exemptions are on it and then we come down to the other definitions about uh, uh, the various exemptions under section 54 uh, 54 onwards uh, the uh, a b c d e f it goes on uh 54 to 54 h it goes on so i'll give a, a, a brief outline of all this and mr dwarakesh has uh, prepared more extensively uh, being on the field uh, he has also prepared some case laws which 
for much interest and he has cherry picked that's the word he used when he spoke to me cherry picked a few important cases which he felt will be of uh, much uh, uh, which would enlighten to a little extent the, the how the courts have handled uh, these issues so that will be the and i think he also has a small powerpoint presentation i personally do not have a powerpoint presentation up here, if I look foolish, better I look foolish. <laughs> so that's the way it is. So with this brief few words, uh, with the permission of uh, you, Mr. Srinivas Raghavan, may I commence with the yes, 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 topic as such? Yes, sir. Now, general principles of taxation, and we are dealing with what is called a direct taxation. And they use this word direct taxation because you'll have to pay out of your pocket immediately for what you earn. What you put in your left hand pocket, you have to take it out from your right hand, somehow wriggle it out, or the tax paper people are going to wriggle it out through your right hand pocket and take it away. So these are direct taxes and income tax is a classical example of direct taxes and the act has been in force for such a number of years and has penetrated every household in this country. At some point or the other, in every family, there's going to be a conversation about the tax which we have to bear over every aspect in uh, our life. Now, uh, there are two uh, general principles of uh, taxation. One is that revenue receipts, quite opposed from capital receipts. Revenue receipts are what we get uh, on a short term or uh, on a day-to-day -day basis are taxable. Revenue receipts are taxable unless specifically exempt. On the other hand, Capital receipts are not taxable unless specifically covered. So this is going to be uh, the basis under which uh, we have to proceed whenever we uh, think about taxation and its application to receipts, either they are revenue in nature or capital in nature. So fundamental concept uh, to repeat is that revenue receipts are taxable unless they are specifically exempt. So there must be a provision which exempts a particular revenue received from being, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from being imposed with tax. But, and capital receipts are not taxable unless they are specifically covered, which on the contrary means that capital receipts are taxable, but not if they are specifically covered, that is if the exemptions are given. Now, what is a capital received to a seller? Now, if I sell a house and I get a substantial portion of consideration in it, because the asset as such, that house is considered to be an asset, a capital asset, maybe what I get would be a revenue receipt in the hands of the buyer, but the purchaser who acquires this house from me, who purchases the house, he gets a, what is called a capital asset. Now, this is going to be the, uh, a small distinction between uh, the capital and the revenue aspect of that. I get consideration in the form of cash. I can say it is my revenue receipt. That is taxable unless it is specifically exempt. Now, when can I escape from this dragnet of tax is what is given in sections 54 uh, in this chapter uh, or in these provisions from 45 to 55 onwards. The, uh, the, the purchaser who gets his capital uh, and asset a capital, it is not taxable unless it is specifically covered, but let us confine ourselves to, to I'll confine myself to myself. And uh, it also depends on the nature of transactions and the facts and circumstances of the case. And the specific de definition cannot be given, but what I'm saying is a broad outline of, uh, the, uh, of the concept. Now, what happens is we get what is called a capital gain. Now, what is capital gain? Capital gain is defined under section two. Two is the uh, definition clauses in practically most of the enactments in this country. And then we have a sub clause 24 and a sub clause 6, which is VI, a small uh, 
Romans uh, 6 of the Income Tax Act. So now capital gain should come under, well, it is defined under that. And uh, I will come back to this uh, definition in a more elaborate manner a little later. But uh, we also have what is a capital asset. First, we, we must know what is a capital asset in the first place, which is uh, defined under section two, sub clause 14. And a capital asset can be divided into two, point, two aspects. One is a long-term capital asset, and the other is a short-term capital asset. Now, a long-term, I'll come back to what actually is a long-term and a short-term capital asset, but the provision of law is that Section 229, Capital A of, our, of the Income Tax Act, it defines a long-term capital asset, and Section 2, Subclause 42A, talks about a short-term capital asset. So now we have these definitions. We have the definition first, uh, what I stated about uh, 224, six about capital gain. And then we have actually what is uh, uh, asset, a capital asset under section 214 and a long-term capital asset under section 229 capital A and a short-term capital asset under Section 242, Capital A. Now, having an asset in our hands is not going to be of uh, any, uh, it will not lead us to any discussion on all these aspects, unless we decide to transfer it, unless we try to sell it, unless we try to convey it to another person. Then the question comes in, what actually is a transfer of a capital asset? Now that again, the definition clause, uh, we'll touch the definition clause first. Section two, sub clause 47, talks about transfers in relation to capital assets. And very coincidentally, we have section 47, a little easier to remember because section two, 40, uh, sub clause 47 is transfer with relation to capital asset and section 47 talks about transactions which are not regarded as, trans as, a tra as transfers. And the exceptions are, we go back to section two sub clause 47. So the concepts we have to understand is capital gains, a capital asset, and a capital asset has two, uh, two dimensions, a short-term, ca long-term capital asset and a short-term capital asset this capital asset will have to be transferred. And then only we come into all these issues about the gains on that, exemptions on that. So transfer is section two, sub clause 47. And section 47 a, a, as a whole talks about transactions which are not transfers. And those tra which are not transfers with other exceptions given under section two, sub clause 47 of the act. Now, uh, I hope uh, with this uh, little bit of, uh, show, uh, of uh, uh, the introduction regarding the sections, let me now come down to what is uh, a capital asset and a short-term capital asset and a long-term capital asset. Now, as, we, as I said, short-term capital asset is section two, sub clause 42, capital A of the Income Tax Act. And uh, they say that any capital asset. Now then I will have to now start with what is a capital asset. A capital asset, as I said, under section 214, and let me be very brief about it. It is an expansive definition, but let us say any kind of property held by the assessee. Now the assessee is the person who's going to transfer it and his income on that is going to be called in question by the revenue. So then he becomes an assessee in so far as the revenue is concerned, this person has transacted a capital asset and therefore he must give an explanation as to what actually he did with his uh, income consideration which he received and also as answer the question whether it is taxable or whether he has fallen into any of the exemptions and claims exemptions from tax. So any kind of property and we move now to the person called an assessee held by him whether or not it is connected with this business 
or profession. So I will limit myself to this. We have an expanded uh, definition of an asset, capital asset. It also includes uh, any securities which had been invested under the SEBI, under the terms of the SEBI Act. And it shall, however, exclude. So what, when we confine ourselves to property, we must also know what is not included. They say that uh, stocks and trade. So stocks and trade cannot be capital assets because once I go on to the definition of a short-term capital asset and a long-term capital asset, we will find that a stock and trade is used for manufacturing purpose to bring about another product. So it takes about a metamorphosis. It is used for manufacturing activities. So stock and trade is not a capital asset. Consumable stores, raw materials. So these are going to develop further. You're going to make a, a further product out of a raw material and this is going to get extinguished by itself. Therefore, these cannot be capital assets, but something which is fixed, something which everybody can see, walk around and see and touch, and, uh, touch it. And the best kind of an example uh, and the safest kind of example is a property. So a property is a capital asset. What is not, I said, stock and trade or a raw material, movable properties uh, held for personal use of the taxpayer or for any member of his family who is dependent on him, but not all movables. Movables may be a car, a vehicle, but jewelry, costly stones and ornaments made of silver, gold, platinum, any other uh, precious metals which uh, anybody can discover, archaeological collections. Now, these are holdings which we will have for our life. Uh, it is not as if we are going to purchase, sell, purchase, sell. And this is something which uh, we can bank on at a time of crisis. Now, when I was thinking about this concept of a capital asset, I thought maybe we can zoom it to this particular uh, uh, concept of a holding in a family, which can be of help in the time of a crisis, till then we hold it. Jewelry, of course, at some point we can convert it, but so long as we hold it, we can call it, it is my capital asset. It comes into the definition of an asset and uh, ornaments and also archeological collections or drawings, paintings, sculptures. So these are all aspects which uh, persons do not buy and sell like uh, tea and coffee every day but which, hold, which they hold on having and give it an additional value to it. It gains value because of its holding, because of its antiqueness, and because of the fact that when traded, it is going to give, bring about a substantial consideration. And also gold bonds and special barrel bonds. And they also say about agricultural lands, but they have an exemption again, which is not situated within the jurisdiction of a municipality or a notified area com committee or a town area committee, cantonment board, which has a population of less than 10,000. And then they also have an area for it, not more than uh, two kilometers, uh, two square kilometers, two kilometers uh, if, the if the population is uh, 10,000. But uh, generally, let us confine ourselves to properties. Now, I come now, once we zero in on what is a capital asset, we'll have to then find out whether this is going to be a short-term capital asset or a long-term capital asset. Now, a short-term capital asset, which is held for not more than 36 months. Let, uh, let me be a little simple, for not more than three years. Immediately prior to the date of transfer, so I should not be having it for more than three years. If I am selling it in the year 2020, if I were to sell it, I should not be having it beyond, uh, over, uh, uh, for a period beyond 2017, 16, 15, 14, and all those things. It, be, it can be considered as a short-term capital asset. However, there are some assets which are held for not more than 12 months or also short-term capital assets. These are shares, equity shares or preference shares, securities, unit trust of India, uh, coupon bonds. Now they, this, the time limit which they give as a cutoff, 
where to define it uh, at long term and a short term is 12 months and three years for a capital asset of other time. So once we find out this 36 months, a three year period and this one year period, we can now assess what is a long term capital asset. A long term capital asset is something which I have for more than three years or for 24 months or 12 months as the case may be. If I hold on to a, a share for more than 12 months, for more than 24 months, touch three years, there can be an interpretation, yes, share, but still, since you are holding it for such a long time, an interpretation can be given that it is a long-term capital asset, that you've been having it as a capital asset for a long period, and it can become under, termed as a long-term capital asset. So now uh, there is also the period of holding which has to be determined, but uh, I will not go too deeply into that concept because uh, that would be a little uh, difficult. But I will straight away come to what is transfer. Because once we have an asset and then we define what we become, uh, we put it in two pigeonholes as a short-term capital asset and a long-term capital asset. That comes in when we effect transfer of that. Because I said a short term is less than three years and a long term is more than three years. Then within that period, less than three years or more than three years, there's got to be a transfer of that particular asset. Now, what actually is a transfer? We, 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 we have a separate enactment, the Transfer of Property Act, but the Income Tax Act is not satisfied with all that. They also have their, their definitions. The tax people, they say, all right, I will also define what is a transfer. And then they bring in the concepts of the Transfer of Property Act to include sale. So I sell it to a person, then I transfer my asset to him. I exchange. So that also comes in, or they've also brought in very significantly relinquishment. So my right title and interest in that property should be totally extinguished once there is a transfer. So the property goes out of my hand and tomorrow I cannot claim it back. So it is the next extension is extinguishment of any right in relation to a capital asset. No, but there is another aspect. This is an act done by me, holder of a property, transferring it voluntarily and extinguishing my own rights in the property. I just give it a total tata and then I say it off. But there is also another aspect, compulsory acquisition. Now that is a very, uh, there are a few provisions relating to that. So compulsory acquisition of an asset when it is done, compensation is paid. What, what is the, well, why do we stand on that? So that also is a transfer. And then a conversion of a capital asset into a stock and trade. So originally we said that a stock and trade is not a capital asset, but when a capital asset is converted into a stock and trade, then there is a transfer. And um, a maturity or a redemption and uh, immovable property can also be transferred if you give possession to another person, to a buyer in part performance of a contract. So the concepts of the sale of goods act with respect to immovable, uh, with respect to movable uh, properties and with respect to immovable properties, not the sale of goods act, but allowing possession of the immovable property with in respect to part performance, section 54 and all those aspects of the Transfer of Property Act then comes into play. And towards part performance, I enter into an agreement of sale and I try to hand over the property to him as part performance. That is a transfer. And so generally any transaction which has the effect of transferring, what, what is transfer? making another person, enabling another person to have the same rights of enjoyment which I had over that particular property, then I move out and he comes in and I have transferred the property to him. Now, when, uh, when this is done, the revenue peeps in and says, all right, what is the consideration you received? Now pay us our share. No, but there are certain transactions, and I talked about section 47. Well, transfer, I said, is section 2, subclause 47. 
And then I said section 47 uh, in itself, which stated that, uh, uh, which said, said that a transfer which is exempted under section 247. So section 47 uh, 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 shall not be regarded as transfer subject to certain conditions. Now we have section, it starts with actually section 46. Section 46 is of uh, distribution of assets by a company to its own shareholders at the time of liquidation. So when, uh, when a company goes into liquidation, it, 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 it's sort of extinguishing the company away. And then what happens is that the assets have to be transferred to maybe for the debts or other aspects that are to the shareholders. And uh, it is not a transfer. The, that uh, cannot be called, uh, 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 termed as a transfer. And then we come into various subclauses of section 47, distribution of a capital asset on total or partial partition of a Hindu united family. So there it is, uh, one person gives up one, the other person takes the other, one share. A house is divided into four parts. So merely because three fourths go to the other three owners, there is not a, uh, you cannot say there is a transfer, but there's a distribution or an equal division of the assets. And the transfer of a capital asset under a gift or a will or an irrevocable trust. And a capital asset by a company to its subsidiary. That also they say is, uh, uh, cannot be considered as a transfer. And then this, uh, it, it all comes in under a scheme of amalgamation and a banking of a banking company with a banking institution. Now that is, I think, a very uh, fluid subject because uh, a few years back, there were this amalgamation of uh, various banks and the government brought in a policy of uh, amalgamation and then there were amalgamation of the assets one, on the, one over the other. So it's not a transfer, but uh, that is, a, that is why I wanted to talk about that. And the transfer of capital assets by a demerged company to a resulting company owing to demerger. And a foreign company, any transfer of a capital asset by a predecessor cooperative bank to a successor cooperative bank. So in effect, it is a continuation. There is a continuation or a continuity of the asset or in the manner in which that asset is going to be put into use then that cannot be termed as a transfer. But when a land or a property is sold and the, I have no control over what the purchaser is going to do with that, a, a simple, uh, this uh, can be a very rough uh, dividing line between what is a transfer and what is a not a transfer, where the seller does not have any control over what the purchaser is going to do, he has transferred it. But in a large extent where the purchase, where the seller also pokes his nose in and sees what the purchaser is doing, like this merger of uh, companies, transfer of capital from a subsidiary, uh, from a wholly owned subsidiary to its holding company, there is going to be some sort of a continuing relationship between the transferor and the transferee. Not, maybe not strictly with the asset as such, but a working relationship between the two entities then Section 47 can be referred into to say that it is not a transfer as defined under the uh, Act. And there are so many. Section 47 goes up to 29 uh, subclauses. And uh, it may, uh, I will have to be taking you through the whole day for uh, that. So let me just uh, to say that uh, this is one, uh, uh, one aspect of the whole thing. And uh, now what happens is, if there is a gain received in a, by, on a sale of capital assets, then it is called a capital gain. Now what is a gain? What I first purchased it at cost price and today what I am selling it for. Now this difference which I get is a capital gain. Now, depending on whether it is a long-term capital asset or a short-term capital asset, this particular gain can also be termed as a long-term capital gain or a short-term capital gain. Now, gain through sale of assets. If we now look at a, a concept of the balance sheet, uh, it is placed under the category of an income. 
and these earnings are liable for taxation. But long-term capital gains and short-term capital gains are taxed differently. And a capital gains tax, the tax which is imposed on this gain, on this difference between the value of the house which I purchased and the value of the house to which I sell, that amount, that gain which I received is taxable and this tax erodes into this gain which I have made. Therefore, to a little extent, government has brought in policies where they say, if you use this gain in a particular manner, if you invest it in a particular manner, you can get an exemption on taxability of that gain. Now, in brief, this is where we head to. So how are we going to invest it? What are the, uh, what are the tricks of the trade where uh, this gain should be further invested to, uh, to, to see that the tax on the gain is, uh, is as minimal as possible or to a large extent to get an exemption in itself. This is the object of uh, what I thought will be the contours of a capital gains uh, exemptions, uh, uh, the topic uh, now under. Now uh, what we are uh, uh, holding, uh, wh wh what the webinar is about. So the government has brought in a list of exemptions under capital gains to help individuals, uh, uh, individuals to minimize their capital gains tax liability. The minute we receive a gain and an income out of the sale of a property, and then we find out what is the gain. That is, what is the difference between the cost price and what is the price we take. That is taxable. Then immediately the SSC, the person who sells, is liable to the government to pay the tax to minimize that liability. Government has brought in certain schemes to certain uh, exemptions. And if we use that to uh, uh, sensibly, uh, we can get, get those gains. And these deductions from the gain which we, re, re, which we have gained is what is called capital gains tax, uh, capital gains exemptions. So it is a, in effect a reduction of the tax which is payable. In some cases, we can also wipe out the tax which is payable. That is a matter for accounts and uh, accountants who can uh, advise it. But this in effect is a concept behind the whole aspect of uh, capital gains exemptions. Now, uh, I, uh, after section 45, uh, exemptions under the capital gains. Uh, now, uh, to protect the income, uh, this is also to protect the income. Now, it will look uh, quite awkward if I were to go and explain to my family that, listen, I have sold the only house which I had, and this is the gain which I get. I'll be tapping around my shoulders for that. But then that peeps in the tax person and says, now come on, you pay the tax to it. Then to protect this income which I have uh, gained, as I said again, I'm putting it in a different manner, that is all, to protect. I brought in the concept of protecting the income which I have received through the sale of capital assets and to decrease the liability, which I have, to, which I have already I, I have committed myself to suffer because I have sold an asset at a larger, at a higher price than for what I purchased it. Then, the uh, government, as I said, has brought in certain exemptions. Now, individuals can gain that, can use those exemptions. Now, there is a, the, now to avail those exemptions, we must know the trickeries of the law. Now, who can uh, gain that? Resident individuals who are below 60 years with an annual income of 2.5 lakhs, they talk about resident income, uh, resident individuals, they cut off the age at 60. And now they say less than 60, more than 60. And then they also have 80, 80 and above, and then they have a 
they have the annual income uh, slab. Now it is 2.5 lakhs, 3 lakhs, and 5 lakhs. Uh, 2.5 lakhs for those who are less than uh, 60 years, uh, more than uh, 60 years, 3 lakhs, and then uh, 5 lakhs for those who are uh, 80 and above. And non-resident uh, non -resident individuals. Now we come to a, a new concept of uh, 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 resident individuals and non-resident individuals. With an annual income of 2.5 lakhs, there, they do not have this age cutoff. And Hindu uh, undivided families with an annual limit of uh, 2.5 lakhs. So these are all uh, aspects of uh, capital uh, uh, the exemptions which are given. Uh, and uh, section 54 is the main uh, section which deals with the exemptions. So I will touch on that. Uh, capital gains exemptions under uh, 64. Uh, under, sorry, uh, under section 54. So what are the conditions which must be satisfied to avail uh, the exemptions under section 54? 54 is not just simple, uh, 54 simple as it is. As in uh, Income Tax Act, we have a string A, B, C, D, they go back to nursery and teach us the alphabets once again. And make it a little confusing also at times. They say, after Z, they say, come back to A, A. And we wonder where the, the nursery teacher made a mistake because I've not heard about it uh, till then. But the Income Tax Act, they give a series of this. Anyway, the, the, it is required because you can't have number of sections that will complicate the act in itself. So what is grouped under one bunch is uh, subdivided like that. So the conditions uh, which uh, are to be uh, satisfied to gain this exemption on sale of a, uh, of a capital is that this particular asset should be a long-term capital asset. So that is three years and above. Let me confine it to a property, three years and above. And then they also say it should be a residential house. So I must sell my house after having it for three years. And then I can look out what is the, how do I get an exemption for it? So it shall be a, it, it should be a residential house and income from such house should be chargeable as an income from house property. Mm. Now we also have what is called a deemed rent for everything. If we do not have to tell the authorities the actual figures, they come up with what they did, uh, they say as a deemed figure. They'd say this is going to be the value of it. If, it, if, I, if I sell it for a lesser price, they can always uh, say, come on now, this is too lesser price. The actual deemed sale is, uh, consideration is going to be this. Uh, deemed, uh, uh, the word deemed comes in often when the taxpayer is not so cooperative or does not disclose the entire facts. Then the authorities have a right under various circumstances to calculate their own uh, amount and uh, call it a deemed uh, figure. And then the seller should purchase. Now this comes in the, uh, the, 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 the actual crux of the uh, provisions come in now. I sell a property, it, uh, I uh, satisfy the condition that it is a long-term asset. I further satisfy the condition that it is a residential house and then I sell it and I get, uh, and I also satisfy the condition that I get a gain out of it. That is the value of the house, the cost price of the house is this much, and I sell it for a considerably higher, uh, higher amount. So I get what is called a profit, an income, not a profit, sorry, but an income of property. Now, with this, to get the benefit of the exemption which this act provides, the Income Tax Act provides. I should buy a residential house. I sell a residential house. I should buy a residential house. Equal, where fair enough. I should have purchased it either one year before the transfer. Now that is tax planning. I can purchase the house and then to, to pay off that consideration, I can say I am going to sell it. So one year gap prior to my transfer or two years after the transfer. So I can have this amount for two years I can invest it in some of the permissible investments, the capital investments, bonds, there are various other schemes given. And, but purchase of a house is mandatory within a period of two years. 
So sale prior to one year and purchase within a period of two years. Now if I want to construct, I want to construct with this money, I want to construct a house. I don't want to purchase, but I want to construct in a vacant land, a house of my choice, uh, uh, in a plan of my choice. Then I have an extended period. I can construct it within a reasonable period. If they say it's three years from the date of sale or transfer. So if I do all this diligently and honestly and declare it, then every, assess, uh, as every assessment officer is going to accept my returns and say, yes, you fall within the exemption clause. Now that brings up to the ultimate uh, concept of a tax that there should be a disclosure and an honest disclosure of all the transactions. That is the basis on which tax is charged. And that is the basis on which an assessment officer says, no, sorry, we have to interfere with what returns you have filed. So that is a fundamental aspect of that. Now, there is yet another, uh, uh, there is a, yet another aspect. And I said about a compulsory acquisition. I am not selling it, but the property is acquired compulsory and that acquisition is not in my hands. I, I cannot stop that. I cannot prevent it. It is acquired for a purpose. Now, in case of compulsory acquisition, the period of acquisition or construction will be determined from the date of receipt of compensation. We all know that, uh, that if it is acquired, getting the compensation, uh, getting a satisfactory compensation after those challenges, after various aspects, division of the compensation, if there's an extended family, who is to get what, what is the ratio? There are all these aspects which come in because suddenly the property goes out of the hands of the family. And so they say that this period uh, is not uh, one year prior, two years after, three years after for construction, but it will be determined from the date of receipt of the uh, compensation. And then they put in a small qualification and then they say whether it is the original or additional compensation. So let us say the final compensation amount, the final compensation amount. And after selling my house here in Chennai, I can't go purchase a house in uh, Maldives or anything, any other place. I must purchase a house back in India. India. A residential house in India. So it should be here within us. It is our Indian Income Tax Act. We should uh, uh, be, uh, be careful of that particular uh, clause also, uh, that stipulation also. And the seller, that is if I sell a house, I am the seller, I cannot buy or purchase a residential house abroad. And then I cannot say, listen, I'm a very honest man, therefore grant me exemption. Uh, they will say, I'm sorry, we can't. So please purchase a house here. There's nothing wrong. We have wonderful houses here. Now, these conditions are cumulative. That is what they say, that each follows, one follows the other. It should be a satisfaction of all these conditions. And even if one condition is not fulfilled, for example, if a residential house is not purchased, if I were to go and purchase a, 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 a commercial apartment, or if I were to sell what is called a commercial apartment, then this goes away. And then I cannot get this benefit under Section 54. And 2021, this assessment year, assessment year 2021, with respect to the financial year 2019-2020, up to March 31st, 2020, from April 1st of 2019 to March 31st, 31st of 2020, whatever it we did, is going to be assessed in the course of this particular year. So from 1st April onwards, all the transactions have to be crystallized and at a particular point of time, you'll have to file the returns and that is going to be assessed. So this becomes the assessment year of 2021. For our transactions in the year 2019 and 20, they have also stated that two residential houses can be purchased. So, and the capital gain, that is the, again, I go back, the gain which I get, the difference between the uh, cost price and uh, uh, the, the price for which I actually sold should not exceed two crores. And I, I get it only once in my lifetime. Now, this in effect 
is a broad outline of a capital gain exemption. There are uh, numerous other clauses. There are uh, numerous other provisions. But uh, to a layman or to somebody who feels that, uh, listen, I need to know what is the position if I were to sell a house, this should be the basic uh, aspect about this. Now, uh, and then we have, the, I, told, I, I, I talked about the deemed provisions, uh, the income tax officer determining a deemed uh, value. So that is section 50, capital C. Now, if they say that I have, uh, I have uh, uh, the, where the immovable property has been transferred for a price below the stamp duty value, then they fix a consideration, call it a deemed sale consideration. And also 50 CA, deemed say sale consideration where any share in a company is transferred below, below a fair market value. So we have that also. And then uh, uh, we also, so the sequence of the sections between 45 and 55 to a large extent is going to be that section 45 is a charging section. Section 47 is, uh, deals with the transactions which are not transfers. And then we go back to section two, sub clause 47. Sure. And then we come to 48, which is a mode of computation. That is uh, the uh, field where chartered accountants have, a, uh, have their expertise in. And then section 55 is the cost of acquisition or cost of improvement. If I were to improve, what is the cost? How do I do it? The cost of acquisition. And 49 with reference to certain modes of uh, acquisition. And section 50B deals with slump sale. So a sale, uh, a slump sale. And uh, we actually will have to look into the wordings for that. And I will do that. And 50C and 50CA are the deemed uh, sale consideration. And the sections 54 to 54H are the exemptions. Now, what are these exemptions? Very broadly, I will tell that. Uh, section uh, 54 is uh, the profit on the sale of property used for residence. 54B trans, uh, relates to capital gain on transfer of land used for agricultural purposes. So that is not to be transferred under certain cases. 54D is compulsory exemption, uh, sorry, acquisition of land and building, not to be charged. And 54E is uh, capital gain on transfer of uh, capital assets in certain cases. And, uh, this, uh, and uh, thereafter, we go over to 54EA, but let me straight away come to 54F, which is uh, again, uh, the exemptions, capital gains on transfer of certain capital assets in case of investment in a residential house. And 54G is shifting of industrial uh, uh, undertakings from, uh, one, uh, from an industrial uh, undertaking to an urban area. So 54F to a large extent should be a primary section which uh, I will have to touch upon. Once uh, I talk about uh, this uh, section 50, 54 and these exemptions. So 54F, 54 and 54F, and now earning income, uh, earning income by sale, immediately, as I said, casts a liability, and it casts a responsibility on the taxpayers to discharge income tax, act, income tax in the case of capital gains. Now, 54F exemption is available under long-term capital gain on the sale of any asset other than a house property. So there are two aspects, one a residential property and then other than a house property. So, uh, the, but for both 54 and 54F, my understanding is that the entire, uh, the entire capital gains will have to be invested. And uh, I would uh, like to get clarification on that because then I won't have any money in my pocket at all. Any, any residual uh, money in my pocket. 
but that is what uh, my understanding of uh, the sec uh, reading of the section says that uh, the entire uh, amount should uh, be invested. And uh, they also say various, uh, a, a few other uh, aspects. Under section 54, uh, in, case of, uh, in case the entire capital gains are not invested, that is in purchasing another residential house, the amount which is not invested is chargeable, is, uh, is uh, charged to tax as a long-term capital gains. And uh, uh, under section 54F, if the entire sale receipts are not exempted, invested, then an exemption is allowed proportionately. So that is for a property other than a house property. That is, you should not own more than one residential house at the time of sale of the original asset. And uh, section 54 also has a particular uh, uh, that this exemption, which I'm, uh, which I'm gaining, which I'm telling the people that please give me exemption because I'm purchasing another house, but you should not sell this particular property, which I have now purchased within three years of the purchase. And then capital gains, now, I, that property which I purchased today, I sell a house A, I, sell a, I purchase a house B. If I were to sell that house B within three years, it becomes a short-term capital asset. Uh, the, the character changes. Now, that is uh, one aspect on that. And uh, if uh, the capital gains do not exceed two crores, then as I said earlier, I can uh, purchase two properties. But under section 54F, uh, we can purchase another residential house within two years of the sale of the original asset. Or if I were to sell, uh, sell the property which I purchased within three years, then the exemption will be reversed, uh, will be reversed. And capital gains, uh, if it is a residential house other than the new house within three years, then they say that the capital gains of the sale will be taxed as a long-term capital gain. So that is one small difference. Unless you go into the practical aspects, it might be a little uh, confusing, but still 54, what you purchase, and if you sell within three years, it's a short-term capital gain. 54F, where you specifically also get, get an exemption, it is treated as a long-term capital gain. And the key points which we will have to remember in all this is that if the cost of the new residential property is less than the total sale amount, then exemption is allowed proportionately. For the remaining amount, for the remaining amount, you, can, you, you, do, you don't have a property for the value you have. You have. If you have a capital gain of one crore, you don't have, you can, and you, the property you purchase is less than one crore. That balance, you will have to reinvest it under section 54 EC in any one of those schemes within a period of six months. And if I were to sell a property and if I were to purchase another property, it must be in my name. I cannot point out to a property purchased in the name of somebody else and say, listen, that is my property. It is not, it should be purchased in my name again. And if a builder of a residential complex construction fails to hand over the property within three years, now construction is three years time limit we said about construction. If I were to construct a residential house in my property, in my land, a three year period is given. But if I place a trust on a, on a builder of a residential complex a construction, residential construction, then if he does not do it within three years, then I can still reasonably have an arguable case, please extend that exemption for me. So that is also that. And uh, it's, uh, there are also cases, uh, and I think Mr. Dwarke should also be expanding on that. And I hope I'm not to overshot my time uh, uh, by this, but that uh, you can purchase two flats in a particular uh, uh, complex. You can, you can gain uh, exemptions. They are not so strict about it and uh, uh, such other uh, exemptions. So the, uh, the, this in effect will be the long and short of uh, exemptions and the capital gains. And I hope that uh, I've been able to clarify a few aspects about purchase and sale of a residential house. And I will stop here. 
and uh, let Mr. Dwarakesh hold the field because he has a PowerPoint presentation. It would be very unfair if uh, uh, all these preparations are not exhibited on screen. So, uh, Mr. Srinivas Raghavan, yes, sir. To the extent I think I've given an outline in the manner in which I understood it. Maybe yes, sir, I think we, maybe not, uh, we, were able, we were able to get exactly a glimpse of what is a basic and just a glimpse, that is all. I'm not preparing anybody here for an income tax exam. I understand. <laughs> for income tax, you're all professionals here. Yeah? So just an uh, outline of uh, somebody new who wants to sell a residential house, now what should he do? Exactly, sir. That fundamentally was the object of uh, what I wanted to say. Now, uh, Mr. Dwarke, <laughs> uh, you, with all the due respects to the time taken by me and uh, no time never no, since sir time has time has never been a constraint he can take his own time no that, that, that i think he can take over now before that i just acknowledge the presence of mr ap was from madras tax firm oh, 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 he'll be doing his part at the end of the story yes yes, yes. Uh, mr dorakesh uh, you can unmute yourself and start yourself yes i have unmuted okay. yes sir First of all, thanks to SSR uh, Law Chamber, Mr. Srinivasa Raghavan, sir, for considering me and uh, giving the opportunity, especially when uh, Honorable Justice, uh, sir, is the chairperson of this panel. I really feel proud and privileged to be one of the speakers uh, in this panel. I should be, first of all, thankful to the Honorable Justice, sir, for being uh, so patient enough to consider my uh, inputs and suggestions, uh, whether it comes to listing out case laws or in terms of uh, preparing the contents, etc. Thank you. So thanks a lot, sir. Okay. So let me start with the topic. The way we have organized this, uh, let me share the screen first. Actually, we have prepared a detailed uh, presentation comprising of uh, around 60 slides. I know it will be unfair on my part to discuss uh, the entire uh, slides now considering the time factor. Uh, Honorable Justice sir, has actually given an elaborate explanation if it comes to the background, whether it comes to the charging section or exemptions, etc. So let me discuss the remaining aspects with the help of uh, some case studies. Let me give a quick overview. The way sections are arranged, uh, as the Honorable Justice sir mentioned, the section 45 uh, talks about the charging section. And uh, the way we can link is from section 45, we can see if the transaction is exempt under section 47. If it's exempt, we need not get into computation at all. If it's not exempt, we have to go to the next stage. We have to make the computation. And we need to see whether it results in capital gain or loss. If it's a capital loss, the only aspect we have to take care of is to file the return within the due date under section 139.1. If it's a capital gain, then we have to go to the subsequent stage of uh, availing the exemptions under section 54 to 54H as applicable to the SSE. So with this, uh, and in addition to these basic sections, we have other sections like section 40X and 46A, which is liquidation and buyback of shares, and uh, section 50B, which talks about slump sale, and the deeming sections, section 50C and 50CA. So precisely everything is linked to section 45. Other than I would say section 46 or 46, yeah, all other sections are linked to section 45 only. So if we address section 45 and some case laws and case studies from that, we will be able to have, uh, able to factor uh, more than 90 percentage of the charging section vertical issues. So now let me get into the charging section, section 45. So actually, I used to tell our uh, article assistants. Uh, this section 45 used to be a one-line section way back in 1970, and uh, now this section runs to two and a half or three pages. The way it was written is, it says that transfer uh, it says that uh, any gain on transfer of uh, capital asset. I would call it a four-step approach. The way section 45 won't read this: any profits or gains arising from the transfer of capital asset affected in the previous year shall save as otherwise provided in section 54 to 54J, I am just containing the definition here, be chargeable to income tax under the head capital gains and shall be deemed to be the income of the previous year in which the transfer took place. So precisely to evaluate whether any uh, is taxable under the head capital gain or not, we need to undertake this four step approach. Firstly, we need to see if there is any capital asset. Secondly, there should be a transfer. 
and uh, whether the transfer is covered in the exemptions in the, in the section 47 or not and finally if there is any gain out of the transfer so this is what i call it uh, four step approach and it should have taken place during the previous year unless it's otherwise provided under the provisions for example in case of compulsory acquisition it's the year of uh, receipt of consideration if it's specifically provided it's taxable in the consent year otherwise it's taxable in the previous year in which transfer takes place so now with uh, we have gone through section 45 this is 451 is the main provision and the other provisions 452 453 etc have been introduced on account of the tax ideations proposed by chartered accountants and advocates like a conversion of a capital asset into stock in trade and selling subsequently or introducing a capital asset into a partnership firm and dissolving the firm and uh, withdrawing the surplus from the firm so these are all indirect ways of transferring the asset which were not part of section 451 in order to catch hold of the specific uh, aspects this section section 452 453 454 etc have been introduced so considering the time factor let me confine to section 451 and the crucial case studies in the context of section 451 as i mentioned earlier section 45 uh, section 47 starts with transactions uh, not regarded as transfer so for the sake of understanding let me read section, some provisions of section uh, 47 as well So I think the section is uh, visible. Yeah. Yes. So, are the contents clear, sir? And yeah, of course. Zoom. Yeah, it's clear. So first, let me read section 47, class 4 and 5 for time being. So section 47 provides exemption to section 45. If any transaction falls in section 47, that won't be regarded as a transfer at all. So let me start with first, let me discuss certain uh, benefits available in the context of corporate taxation then let me get into individual taxation especially section 54 54f etc so now let me read section 47 4 and 5 for the sake of the general audience 47 section 47 starts with nothing contained in section 45 shall apply to the following transfers class 4 any transfer of capital asset by a company to its subsidiary if the parent company or its nominees hold the whole of the share capital of the subsidiary company and the subsidiary company is an Indian company. This is how 41 4 is. It talks about transfer of asset by a holding company to its 100% subsidiary. Then comes section 45, 47 5, which says any transfer of capital asset by a subsidiary company to the holding company, if the whole of the share of the subsidiary company is held by the holding company and the holding company is an Indian company. So the crux of the aspect is the transfer should be an Indian company. The transfer should be an Indian company. That's the crux of the aspect. And secondly, it should be a wholly owned subsidiary or it should be a 100% holding company. That's what is expected out of these two sections. But interestingly, if we see class 47.4, class of class, a uses the term parent company or its nominees but 47.5 just says that whole of the share capital of subsidiary companies held by the holding company the term or, or its nominees is specifically absent in this section 47.5 here it says parent company or its nominees here it says it's held by the holding company the term or its nominees is not available in this Class 47.5. A dispute has been arising time and again. If a subsidiary is transferring assets to holding company, it is completely held by the holding company, but for one share, which is mandated under the provisions of the company side. Because in practice, a private limited company cannot hold uh, one share, uh, cannot uh, have only one share order. There needs to be a minimum of uh, two shareholders. Two. In the, hands of, in the case of a private company. So the question that arises is uh, why the benefit should not be extended to a case where uh, the share, in case of 47.5 which is available in the case of 47.4. So time and again it has been discussed and there are a, a couple of adverse precedents as well. 
by authority for advanced holdings, which says that the law should be read as it is. The benefit is available only if it is completely held by the holding company. That will not be eligible even in a case where the single share of subsidiary company is held uh, in the capacity of nominee and not in the capacity of beneficial shareholder. To that extent, AIR made an observation and passed an adverse judgment. However, recently this issue has been deliberated before the Madras High Court in the case of uh, Shadlow India Limited. In this case, assets have been transferred by subsidiary to holding company. The court has gone to the integrities of the Companies Act and the concept of nominee shareholding. This is the judgment. The Madras High Court went to the extent of uh, the Creditor Companies Act and the concept of nominee shareholding and appreciated the fact that in practice a company cannot be held by a single shareholder. There needs to be multiple shareholders. Therefore, given that uh, the shares are 100% held by, uh, I would say 99.99% held by the main shareholder, and the 0.01% is held by the second shareholder in nominee capacity, uh, the benefits of Section 47 Class 5 should be available in the hands of the transfer company, which is a subsidiary. And the capital gain should not be subject to tax in the hands of the subsidiary company. That's the judicial development in the context of uh, 47 5. I would like to quickly touch upon one international tax uh, aspect here. Actually, uh, uh, since you don't have time, I don't, uh, I don't want to open all tax treaties now and discuss. Let me put it in two, three lines and we can brainstorm that later as well. Otherwise, we'll be confining to this case study only. Okay. There is a concept called non discrimination in international taxation, which says that. Uh, a resident of one contracting state cannot be subject to uh, less beneficial provision or more burdensome. That is the term treaty has used in the other contracting state. So that is as far as non discrimination is concerned. So there are multiple subclasses in non under non discrimination. One of the subclasses is ownership non discrimination. What it says is any enterprise which is held by resident of other contracting state. For example, if there is an Indian company. It is held by a shareholder of US. Such Indian company should not be subject to discriminatory treatment as compared to the Indian company, which is held by an Indian shareholder. This is what called as ownership non-discrimination. So here the SSE might be Indian company, but if, uh, such Indian company held by US shareholder should not be subject to burdensome provision. So let us read section 47.5 this way. In this case, I understand the shareholder is an Indian company. Let us think of a scenario where the 100% holding company is a US company, whereas the subsidiary is an Indian company. 47 class 5 says the whole of the share capital is held by the holding company and the holding company is an Indian company. So let's take a situation where an Indian company is having certain shares and they are transferring it to their 100% parent company in US. It is generally taxable under section, section 47 and 45. The benefits under section 47 5 it's, is not available in the hands of the transfer company in this case. On a plain reading of section 45 related with section 47 5 of the act. But applying the concept of non discrimination in this case, the subsidiary company is uh, subject to discriminatory treatment. That should not be the case. This is one of the solutions that could be explored. So 47.5 should be applicable on transfer of asset by an Indian company to its foreign parent company, provided the relevant treaty provides for ownership non-discrimination article. So this is one of the value added uh, aspect I thought of uh, uh, bringing in the, here. And now let me get into the next case study. This is in the context of uh, computation of uh, MAT. I would say capital gains coupled with MAT provisions. So let me quickly explain what is MAT uh, in a bird's eye view. MAT is nothing but minimum alternate tax. Uh, there were companies who were uh, availing the beneficial provisions of the act. They were showing a rosy picture to the shareholders and declaring dividend, but they were not paying income tax. So therefore, in order to avoid uh, such uh, things, a uh, map has been specifically introduced, which will tax only the book profit. 
without considering any uh, deduction or any exemption otherwise available in the under the income tax act for mat what really matters is section 115 jb and the computation methodology has been specifically provided under section 115 jb like its start, the starting point will be net profit as per profit and loss account and uh, under explanation one to section 115 jb talks about certain certain plus that needs to be added and certain items that needs to be reduced for the purpose of computing book profit so it's nothing but net profit add additions as per explanation 1 to 115 jb less items as per explanation 1 to section 115 jb that will be the book profit on that uh, mat has to be paid that is how it reads so there has been time and again there has been arguments and uh, decisions which says that uh, uh for uh, for computation of uh, mat under section 115 jb what really matters is the profit as per profit and loss account and not any other provisions of the act i have one practical question here no doubt under mat uh, mat overrides all other provisions of the act because it starts with the term not which i think the section 115 jb is uh, visible is it visible or not yes it's visible Visible, right? One fifteen GB. Okay. So MAT starts with one fifteen GB, sir. Not extending anything contained in any other provisions of this Act. So it's a non-abstract clause. So it overrides the other provisions of the Act. Now, with this, let's uh, ask few questions ourselves in the context of capital gains. Let us say a company is selling its agricultural land and earning profits on sale of agricultural land. Agricultural land is not a capital asset under Section 2, Class 14 or Subsection 14. It is not a capital asset. It is not taxable under the general provisions of the Act. So it is neither taxable under Section 45 in the first place. Whereas if a company sells agricultural land and earns profit out of it, such profit used to be credited to uh, profit and loss account. Whether That whether the such profits can be subject to book profit under Section 150 JB of the Act. It's question number one. It has already been decided in one case. And another question, let me ask. This is at least Section uh, 214 specifically excludes. I would say rural agricultural land. Let me be even more clear. I am telling rural agricultural land, which is not specific, uh, not uh, located within the specified areas. That is case study number one. L let me come to case study number two. Uh, say let's say a company has earned capital gains computed to section 45 red bit section 48 and they have invested in rural education bonds under section 54 ec for the purpose of availing the exemption under this scenario whether the benefits of section 54 ec would be available for the purpose of computation of mat as well that's question number 2 i would like to address So first of all, there is no doubt MAT overrides other provisions of the Act. But can MAT override the basic charging section or basic scope of total income? If you say MAT overrides other provisions of the Act, it should be subject to basic charging section and uh, basic scope of total income. If something is not falling within the scope of total income, how it can be brought within the ambit of MAT? So any provision should be read in a harmonious manner. So in this regard, I would like to refer to two contrary judgments. The first judgment is in the context of uh, Section 54 EC, which has been decided by the Madras High Court in the case of CAT versus Metal Chromium Platter, where the High Court has gone into the provisions of Section 45, read with Section 54 EC, and held that. If anything is exempt under Section 54 EC, that would not be subject to Section 45 in the first place, and such provision would not fall within the scope of income at all. So, if something is not falling within the scope of income, how the alternate tax of um, such as MAT can be levied on such income? That was the question raised by Madras High Court, and the issue was ruled in favour of the taxpayer. Let me repeat the case: It's uh, CAT versus Metal Chromium Platter Private Limited. the interesting aspect is with respect to taxability of uh, on profit on sale of agricultural land 
the kerala high court in the case of uh, cit versus harrisons malayalam limited has held that there is no specific exclusion under section 115 jb of the uh, act with respect to any profit arising on uh, uh, transfer of uh, agricultural land what is exempt is only the agricultural income so agricultural income is should only be reduced and not uh, any profit on sale of agricultural land that has been held in the case by the interestingly by the kerala high court in the case of uh, harrisons malayalam limited in this so what i am representing to say is there are two contrary judgments uh, by two different high courts so now i am now i am wondering what if both these cases gets clubbed and heard together by the honorable supreme court what if the kerala high court case is presented first to say that uh, first of all the income tax act has uh, no income uh, the central government has no power to tax any profit on sale of agriculture land actually what i understand is i am not a constitutional expert so i am not the right person to comment on it but i would like to give some heads up and i will uh, leave it to the audience to brainstorm this aspect under union list it says it specifically excludes capital value on sale of agricultural land so the central government has no power to tax any gain on sale of agricultural land in the first place that's one of the argument that has been put forth the uh, indi kerala high court judgment which has not been appreciated actually so these two contrary judgments are in the context of 115 jb and there are other tribunal judgments including the decision of chennai iit where the principle laid down by the madras high court uh, has been uh, upheld and there are other jurisdictional tribunals as well uh, which is there either or against the tax payer so this issue will reach finality only when the supreme court takes a final call on on this on the same and interestingly in the previous case study we spoke about section 47 4 and 47 5 transfer of asset by holding to subsidiary company actually in the case of rain commodities limited the hyderabad itat has appreciated the fact that transfer of asset by holding to subsidiary yes it is not taxable but if it comes to levy of mat what matters is the net profit as per profit and loss account so in this case the hyderabad idt special bench has held that this beneficial provision would not be available and just because if an amount is exempt under section 474 this cannot be used as a factor to avail exemption from nat as well so these are this is a nutshell of uh, favorable and adverse rulings in the context of section uh, 474 section 475 and 115 jb i would say if you read section 247 it uses the term transfer includes sale exchange extinguishment of asset or relinquishment of any right it uses the term exchange as well it's not confined to mere sale whereas if we read the section 50b that uses the term slump sale that doesn't use the word anything called a slump exchange so there are decisions which is which are appreciated by high courts as well which says that suppose if a company is trans undertaking on a slump sale basis the undertaking as a whole is transferred and as a consideration what they are receiving is non monetary let's say they are receiving shares of the other company transfer company in such cases the courts have appreciated the fact that uh, there is a difference between sale and exchange section 247 is void enough to catch hold of both the term sale as well as exchange whereas section 50b is confined to the term sale alone therefore section 50b doesn't include slump exchange it has been uh, it upheld in a famous judgment in 2011 mumbai tribunal what it called bharat bijli and it was later upheld by bombay high court in 2014 and subsequently there are other favorable verdicts as well on this aspect which says that there is between sale and exchange what is taxable under 50b is only slump sale and not slump exchange in the first place so this is one of the interpretations which courts have appreciated as well so now with this background let me get into two interesting case laws in what in the first case law it is it is a, uh, a metro psycho judgment in the case of uh, principal cit versus uh, yogaratnam it's a case where two brothers have exchanged lands and under the disguise of family settlement 
So there is no existing dispute in the first place. So Mr. X and Mr. Y are brothers. Mr. X wants to get hold of some land from Mr. Y. As a consideration, he passed on and available his available portion to Mr. X. So it's a clear cut exchange. But given that uh, they are siblings and uh, they termed it as a settlement deed, and this issue has been decided by CATA and uh, ITAT in favor of the taxpayer. The Honorable Madras High Court remarked, a specific remark that uh, this issue has not been analyzed in detail and the matter has been remanded back to the file of CATA. So it's a typical case of exchange where the High Court has made an observation that not that all transactions between relatives and siblings will fall within the ambit of family settlement. If there is no existing dispute or is there a, a mere settlement agreement would not suffice to recharacterize as a family settlement and to come out of taxation ambit. So with these remarks, the matter has been remanded back to the file of CATA. So I would say this is a simple and uh, straightforward case. So now let's get into another crucial case of Delhi High Court in the case of uh, Nalwa Investment uh, Limited. So it's a peculiar case where the taxpayer had investments in a company called Jindal Ferro Alloy Limited, JFAL, I would say. These investments have been held as a stock in trade in their books. And this the company, the JFAL, Jindal Ferro Alloy Limited, has been merged into another company called JSL. Jindal Strips Limited. So as a result of this amalgamation, the amalgamated company Jindal Strips Limited is uh, duty bound to issue shares to the shareholder, Nalwa Investments Limited. Now the SSC is receiving shares. What has happened is there is an amalgamation. The SSC didn't do anything. He just had investment in company A. Company A got merged into company B. And company B is giving him shares. Here, where is the question of sale from his side? He has not sold, he has not exchanged, he has not relinquished his right. The SSC has not done anything on his own contract and it's not even a compulsory acquisition. But the important aspect which the Honorable Delhi High Court has noted is, it has uh, considered the fact that, as the Honorable Justice sir rightly mentioned, uh, Section 47 gives exemption for amalgamation as well. It says that the section 47 of class 7 gives exemption in respect of amalgamation. But that's applicable only in a case where the underlying shares are held as a capital asset, not as a stock in trade. So the High Court held that here the whatever exemption is there is fine. Let it be for it, 47, 7 be there or whatever it is. But it's applicable only when it's held as capital asset. In this case, it is held as a stock in trade. So that is in the absence of specific exemption, the High Court held that this ex, uh, issue of shares by the amalgamated company to the shareholders of amalgamating company has to be regarded as business income. So the SSC has to compute tax on the fair market value of the assets uh, of the shares obtained from the amalgamated company and the cost as per his books in the amalgamating company and uh, he has to compute tax on a differential sum and which would be subject to tax in the year of amalgamation itself. Now I have two questions. I would like to link this section with section 43 CA of the act. So I, want, I have a question on this section as well as uh, on, on this section on this judgment I would say. I have a query. No doubt the High Court has held that the SSC has earned the benefit by way of getting shares in, the, in company B uh, and the differential amount is getting taxed. But my question is how it will be recorded in his books? I don't think there is any option to revalue the shares in his books. In the year of sale of shares of company B, how it will be computed under the head PGBP is one question. I am linking this question to section 43CA. 43CA talks about uh, transfer of land for a consideration below stamp duty value or below fair market value, however we word it in colloquial sense. See, section 50C is the deeming provision, as we mentioned earlier. If any, if the lands, uh, we, uh, so let's assume I'm selling a land for 1 crore, whereas the stamp duty value is 1.5 crores. Then 50C deeming provision 
as per applying the stringency deeming provision the deemed consideration has to be 1.5 crores and not 1 crores 1 crore that's applicable in the case of where it's held as capital asset in similar manner if i am in the receiving end let's assume i am buying a land swaragesh is buying a land so in this case section 56210 will come into picture to tax the difference between the stamp duty value of the asset purchased and uh, the cost incurred by the buyer so the 50 lakhs will be taxable in the hands of the buyer so now my question, my precise question is no doubt uh, section four, similarly section 43 ca of the act uh, is applicable in the case of uh, profits and gains of uh, business or profession which is applicable where the property is uh, held as a business asset by the buyer now my question is already it is getting taxed in the hands of 50 c in the hands of seller and there is double taxation in the hands of buyer the reason given by the finance uh, i mean the the under the act is it says that the buyer can consider it as a cost is there no double taxation in one side under 50 c it is taxed in the hands of the seller in the same year it is taxed in the hands of the buyer also the buyer is considering this one and of crores as uh, as cost of the asset there is no doubt about it in the year of sale but the question is the same income is getting taxed in the hands of seller as well as in the hands of the buyer therefore there is dual taxation on this aspect so there are some open areas which need to be addressed it will get addressed only if the issues are raised by, uh, at high court level or at uh, supreme court level let's say now we just coming back to the question of uh, nalwa investment the delhi high court wording in the case of nalwa, nalwa investment actually the court emphasized on the supreme court wording in the case of orient trading in the case of orient trading the assc is a short trader he has exchanged shares but the crucial fact which was not put forth before the delhi high court is in the case of orient trading it's not a case of amalgamation it's a case of simple exchange no doubt in case of simple exchange it's taxable whether it's under capital gains or under the head business income whereas in the case of amalgamation in my understanding there are lots of precedents in the context of income tax act 1922 and there are judgments of privy council as well which says that amalgamation should be given pass through treatment that's well before section 47 class 7 was introduced i would say even section 47 seven was introduced considering the principle laid by the supreme court in such cases so in my humble view the amalgamation takes place as an order of, through an order of court only so receipt of shares under the amalgamation it's nothing but a consequence so that's not a commercial transaction or intentional transaction which has been undertaken by the taxpayer it's only a coincidence i would say still there are uh, Uh, still uh, there are other professionals who are of the view that 28 class 4 under the head pgvp is uh, is uh, broad enough to cover any transaction which is uh, which is otherwise not taxable under any of the provisions which is not otherwise exempt i would say so they are saying it might get hit under section 28 class 4 even though there is no specific provision so with this i will return to the second case study now let me get into the provisions related to exemptions so with this now let me get into the exempt exemptions quickly let me quickly run through and discuss two or three case studies uh, and we can come to the session so every law has its own exemptions exceptions so similarly under the provision of capital gain as the honorable justice rightly mentioned uh, exemptions has been arranged in such a manner few, few exemptions are related to all taxpayers but few are related only to individual and uh, hf so let me quickly distinguish between section 54 and uh, 54f and uh, some discuss some case studies uh, on that section 54 is applicable when the asset sold is uh, the eligible asset is individual hf in both cases and in case of section 54 the underlying asset should be long term capital asset whereas for 54f it should be long term capital asset other than residential use property in first case it's residential use property and where the investment should be the investment should be in a residential use property in both cases whether it's 54 or 54f the investment should be only in residential use property and there is a time limit of uh, in case of uh, 
purchase of house property it's one year before or two years after the date of transfer whereas if it comes to construction it's three years from the date of transfer so there is a reason to gujarat high court verdict where they clearly said we can prepone the purchase that is we can purchase an asset one year prior to the date of transfer but we cannot start construction one year prior to the date of transfer that's an important observation by the reason gujarat high court verdict let me share the decision quickly and the quantum of exemptions plays another crucial role as honorable justice rightly pointed out in case of 54 it is confined only to the net capital gains whereas if it comes to 54 year the taxpayer has to invest the entire consideration this table will explain uh, better than me let's assume the sale consideration is 1 crore and the index cost of acquisition is 40 lakhs the capital gain before exemption is 60 lakhs in both cases under 54 year it's enough if the taxpayer invest 60 lakhs he can invest 60 lakhs and uh, he can deposit 40 lakhs in his bank account and he can simply relax the tax liability would be nil in this case whereas in the second scenario if he is investing the similar 60 lakhs only the propo proportionate amount uh, will be available as exemption that is 60 lakh the net consideration is 1 crore capital gain is 60 lakhs amount invested is 60 lakhs so he has invested only 60 percentage so 60 percentage of gain only will be exempt under section 54f that's all so the assessee will end up paying tax on rupees 24 lakhs under the capital gains and we can raise one question okay no doubt the assessee has invested in the asset and he has complied whether is there any other condition like uh, how many assets he can have whether he needs to have one house property no such provision is available in section 54 whereas section 54 f emphasizes more burden on the taxpayer saying that the assessee should not own more than one residential house as on the date of transfer if he has already bought any new asset for the purpose of 54 f it is fine but other than that he cannot have more than one house property and he should not purchase any new residential house property within 3 2 years or construct within 3 years so 54 years imposes more burden on the taxpayer <coughs> and let's see the consequence what if they violate the condition in the context of section 54 the benefit which the assessee already availed will be reduced from the cost of acquisition but in the case of 54f the capital gain benefit which he enjoyed will be uh, uh, will be revoked in subsequent year and he has to uh, pay tax on that so again this example will speak better than me i know it's confusing uh, i am just uh, developing the same example this uh, in case of section 54 the capital gain was nil in the first case it was 24 lakh in the second case now i am assuming that in the subsequent year he has got uh, as he has identified a buyer and he wants to sell the properties let's assume he has uh, he is selling this asset for 1.1 crore and the second one 1.2 crores so what will happen is <clears throat> since the condition has not been complied the cost of acquisition will get reduced in the new asset so the cost of acquisition of new asset will become nil in the case of section 54 he has invested 60 lakhs earlier he has availed the benefit of 60 lakhs what will happen is given that he has violated the condition the cost of acquisition has to be reduced by the amount already claimed as exemption so that the cost of acquisition is nil so the short term capital gain will be 1.1 crore and he has to pay tax at regular rates whereas in the case of 54f even if he violates the condition what will happen is the difference between sale consideration and uh, <coughs> <clears throat> investment will get taxed in the year of transfer and the gain and the gain which uh, and the exemption which we availed will be taxed as long term capital gains only that won't be reduced from the cost of acquisition that's another important factor which we have to make a note here i'm sorry it's uh, please read us 1.1 crores so 1.1 crore minus 60 lakhs is 50 lakhs this 50 lakhs is the gain he has made out of second property whereas 
the exemption which he availed in the earlier year is 36 lakhs so in this case at least only 50 lakhs is taxed at regular rate and 36 lakhs is taxable as long term capital gains at 20 percent only so to this extent i would say 54f is beneficial as compared to 54 so if anybody who is intending to violate i would recommend let them uh, go i would recommend 54f is the beneficial provision for them than 54 of course you're not at the option i would say so let's discuss some uh, two or three case studies this is in the context of uh, individual taxation only prominently earlier there was a question on whether it's applicable only for uh, one new house property or a new house property or actually i can say that this is the question i i faced during my interview in the first organization the HR, uh, during HR round, I, I faced this question. The, the answer I gave was pretty simple. I gave a logical conclusion and succeeded. That's a different story. But I can't give the same opinion to my client. I gave the reasoning that uh, in the context of uh, a general process that singular includes plural. And uh, most of the provision says that person committing a murder should be subject to imprisonment. If a person has committed two murders, you should not be acquitted. Saying that the law says person committing a murder. So that's the logical reason I gave and uh, I walked through. So, but uh, earlier there was interpretation that single includes plural and one house property should be uh, included to multiple house property. But in 2014, Finance Act 2 of 2014, all provisions related to individual taxation went a complete overhaul, I would say, whether it comes to capital gains or whether it comes to salary tax or not. So, it went a complete overhaul where they made it clear that it's confined. Now they made it one residential house property. And also now made, they made it clear that uh, it should be within India, not outside India. A question arises whether it's prospective or retrospective. No doubt it's not a retrospective amendment. It just says that earlier it was a residential house property. They removed the uh, term a residential and made it one residential. So it cannot be given retrospective effect. This has been upheld in uh, various prisons, including the Madras High Court in one or two judgments. Now another question arises. Let's take a case where one person has uh, three residential house properties. Property one has been sold. Property, he is holding property two and three. If we invest in a new residential house property, whether he is entitled to section 54F. So now uh, the question we need to ask is, it uses a residential house property. That means it shouldn't be a business asset in his hands. In, a, in Coming back to the example, property one has been sold. He is holding property two for the purpose of his business or as an inventory in his books. Let's assume he's a builder. It's not a capital asset in his books. And uh, question in the property three is the only residential house property in his hands. So this question was raised uh, yeah, before Karnataka High Court in the case of Grigori Mann. Yes, that the Karnataka has clearly held that in the context of capital gain, we need to see whether it's a residential uh, house property. As well. So it shouldn't include any other property used for non-residential purposes and for business purposes. So it should include anything used for his own business, or it should sorry, it should exclude and it should exclude any property which is held as a stock in trade in his books. So in that case, the taxpayer had only, uh, though he had two properties on a logical basis, he had only one residential property for the purpose of section 54, or uh, 54F, and therefore uh, it says that it's not applicable at all. The, so he is satisfying the condition and uh, the exemption has been allowed in the case of the taxpayer under 54F. Now let me discuss one interesting case study in uh, section 50C. Let me come to the session with this case study. I think uh, it's already 650. Okay. And give some time for the audience to uh, come back with their comments or queries if me. Section 50C. Now I have a question. I have a residential house property. I am selling it for one uh, crore. Whereas the stamp duty value is two crores. And I am investing the entire consideration under 54 years. I would not house property, it's a land. I am investing it in, uh, in a house property for uh, under section 54F. And I am investing the entire amount. Here, the, uh, in the case of uh, Prakash, Karnavat and other subsequent judgments, the arguments put forth before Jaipur I, uh, tribunal is 
the taxpayer no doubt has got one crore it's well below market value but he has invested the entire consideration in the new asset so where he has invested the entire consideration in the new asset where is the question of deeming additional capital gains in his hands that question was raised so the jaipur idd appreciated uh, this interpretation and held that 50c should be read on a holistic basis and given that the taxpayer is in the to invest in a new property and he has given he has invested the entire amount there won't be any further uh, attribution under section 50c and uh, the bench held that there is no further capital gains in the hands of the taxpayer okay. so with this uh, i'd like to complete the session thanks a lot uh, once i thanks again uh, ssr law chambers and uh, honorable justice sir for being so patient and uh, for time and thanks a lot i have to thanks the thank the audience uh, for your patience and time thank you if there any queries so you can raise it through you know zagon sir he will moderate and uh, he will bounce it to us thank, thank you mr brother thank you mr brother kesh for your illustrious session may I request a lot ship to have any other uh, some things to fire uh, i just have uh, one aspect to uh, to query mr dwarkesh yes sir comment on that and i am sure uh, maybe other uh, distinguished participants may also put their thoughts into it yes. there was issue about amalgamation of uh, companies and uh, the lana chartered accountant raised a query about double taxation and that uh, it was not in the hands of the shareholder that there was no transfer or it was not his voluntary act but owing to amalgamation it a consequential act of uh, the value being uh, uh, increased but uh, do we not uh, look into the provisions of 391 to 396 of the companies act which deals with uh, amalgamations and a step by step process for amalgamation one of them is that the shareholders must give the consent to the terms of the amalgamation so then can we not say that there is a deemed consent by the trans uh, by the shareholders for their value of the shares being uh, valued at a different on amalgamation amalgamation a and b brings about a new company c that's a fundamental uh, concept of that so there is a consent given by the uh, share, by the shareholders for the revaluation of the shareholdings in their hands so then naturally then they accept to accept the liability for uh, the increased value or the acquisition um so question i think um, some of the tax lawyers may have to uh, brainstorm may I ask anybody here sir <laughs> No, okay, the charter accountant was raising a doubt about uh, the ratio. Yes, sir, he was raising the same doubt. Dwarki, <laughs> sir, you have anything yes, to offer this this matter? Sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No doubt, it's happening with the consent of uh, shareholders. But uh, the humble submission is uh, section forty-seven seven specifically exempts, considering the fact that it is not meant for. Uh, earning value for the shareholders but for creating wealth for the company amalgamation is an act which uh, doesn't merely of course shareholders are the collateral beneficiaries there is no doubt about it but uh, no real income arises in the hands of the shareholders is uh, my humble contention i completely agree that yes shareholders have given consent and their value is ultimately getting increased as a consequence of amalgamation there is no doubt about it i completely agree with that it uh, i would say considering this fact the taxpayers argument our argument is in a weaker footing only i completely agree with this aspect sir i completely agree but one more aspect i have to put forth is uh, tax the shareholder has not got any consideration without sale of the property and the second doubt i have is uh, would have been great had the court mentioned that such increased value has to be considered as the cost of acquisition in the year of sale that will again be in the accounts there is no option to revalue any inventory in my understanding thank you dwarakish hemalata you got something to say mala talked about the 391 to 96 of the company act of the amalgamation there is a specific judgment of the bombay high court taking a stand saying that the exchange is not coming under the 247 of the transfer of capital asset So actually, the the render judgment in favor of the ICC, say, saying that exchange is not a transfer, the consideration is not necessary. The slum sale says about the only the monetary consideration, not in the exchange of shares. 
But 47 is entirely different. That is an amalgamation. But Delhi High Court has taken a different view, saying that excluding the 47. So that is a decision. Day before yesterday, we argued the matter in length before the TSJ bench. So. <laughs> exactly. I think uh, Mr. Balaji has given a comment in the chat box. Yes. Mr. Balaji. Yes. Let's see whether he is available now. Yes. Uh, Mr. Balaji, you can share your experience of uh, the judgment reserved by the bench. Mr. Balaji. Uh, I, I, in fact, I, as I had quoted, uh, Honorable uh, CVJ had, uh, you know, in one line summarized the entire Income Tax Act. I should say that the first opening remark that all. Uh, revenue receipts are taxable unless specifically exempt and all capital receipts are exempt unless specifically taxed. I think that's probably the best remark on the entire Income Tax Act. Uh, in fact, uh, I had put it immediately after he had uh, quoted this line. I saw, the, I saw uh, that. I, I saw that. Immediately. And uh, as regards uh, the last remark of uh, uh, no, Dwarakesh, who is a good friend of mine too, uh, the uh, whether slump sale results in exchange or there should be a sale within some slaves. Uh, the, uh, it is quite interesting issue. Uh, the, as uh, Hemalata had put it, she has argued for the revenue last week and uh, counsel from uh, <laughs> Delhi had argued this matter. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, shortly the Madras High Court would be, uh, uh, the decision should be out on that. And uh, I may make one more submission, sir. Why not? Yes. On 54, uh, Dwarakish has told he had a doubt whether A and 1 are one and the same. Uh, the law, as he has put it, has been amended a few years back uh, yes. to say that you know, these two are different. <clears throat> A could be multiple. And now they specifically amended to say only one house. Post amendment 2, incidentally, Madras High Court, on a peculiar situation with reference to HF, has considered more than one house investment would also fall within one house. Because it said on HUF, there are multiple members, there could be uh, more investments too. That's a quite interesting observation from the Honorable High Court. And uh, probably, uh, you know, it is restricted only to the situations of HUF. Uh, nevertheless, I would still believe the room could be open for somebody say uh, the amendment between A and 1 has not filled the gap and still there is a scope for saying that uh, no, more than one house could also be eligible for. Mr. Balaji, go ahead with. Go for one house or scope for one, more than one litigation? More than one litigation has been interpreted as a plural, not a single. Okay. That is the definition of Madras I got. <laughs> okay. Mr. Sridharan is writing on the line. Uh, sir, my question is uh, to Mr. Dwarakesh. Uh, you had uh, spoken about uh, transfer of rural agricultural land uh, by companies under the 115 JV book profit route. Yes. Uh, you had stated that uh, you had raised a query uh, that uh, whether at all 115 JV should be satisfying the conditions of charging uh, under section 45 or not. Uh, not precisely 45, I was uh, just trying to say, okay, please proceed, sir. Let me so, explain. Uh, now, please section proceed. 4, uh, which is the charging section for income tax, says it is subject to provisions of this act. Yes. Uh, does that not mean that uh, it is subject to section 115 JB also? If that is the case, uh, how can we say that any taxation under 115 JB has to satisfy the conditions of charge under section 28 or 45 or 56? Whatever it may be. Answering to your question, okay. Answering to your question, actually the memorandum to finance act when while introducing section 115 JB, as I mentioned earlier, it says that uh, the shareholders are um, the company is providing a rosy picture to shareholders by showing higher profits, but reduced uh, uh, reduced the income if it comes to taxation to overcome that one day the section provisions of 115 JB has been introduced. So what I'm trying to say is, any gain on transfer of agricultural land, it doesn't fall within the ambit of income at all. If it anything mm -hmm. falls within the ambit of income and 
separately subject to any exemption or deduction i completely agree section uh, 115 jb would apply so in my humble view uh, i'm not sure if i am the right person or competent person to content this way if you ask me whether 54 ec would be available for 115 jb in my humble view i would say it should not be because 45 is an independent charging section 48 is computation section 54 ec is only providing exemption to income which is otherwise the tax whereas if it comes to agricultural land it's not falling within the purview of the act at all so no doubt 115 jb can override any other provision of the act but it cannot override the intent of the act itself is my humble mm-hmm. suggestion ஜட்ஜ்மெண்ட் friend wants about the capital gains uh, for calculation of capital gains in this sort of agreements for the land owner yes okay okay sir see section 45 5a has been introduced in finance act 2017 which is specifically in the context of uh, joint development agreement uh, only or earlier there was a dispute going on whether uh, in the case of joint development agreement whether taxability is the year of executing jda or year of getting possession of fact I mean flat or year of actual sale of flat that question was deliberately reached multiple forums and multiple forums came with different principles under different fact patterns so to bridge the gap section uh, 45 5a uh, talks about uh, joint development agreement what it says is in case of joint development agreement the year in which taxable should be the year in which certification date of completion is obtained for okay. the building Okay. So let's assume there are t- ten flats. Two belong to the land owner and eight belong uh, to the developer. The land owner has uh, would be subject to capital gain tax in the year in which certain amount has been obtained for his portion of flats. I would say. And secondly, the fair market value, stamp duty value of the flat as on the date of its certain amount of completion would be the deemed sale consideration. I think he has strictly answered the question of Nadrajan. Yeah. Next question by one Meena. Sir, if the SSC has invested in a joint property, whether he can claim exemption under Section 54 for his portion? Mr. Sandeep Kumar has also given some comments about uh, Mr. Natarajan's uh, question. In, yeah, next, yes, sir. Yes. Now, <laughs> he said it requires a full day. <laughs> <laughs> if the SSC has invested in a joint property, yes. Uh, Mr. Varakesh, yes, what is your call on that? So, fifty section fifty four year period question. Uh, yes, no sir. Section fifty four. The question raised by Miss Meena. Yeah, Meena. If the SSC has invested in a joint property, whether he can claim exemption under section fifty four for his portion? Yes, I think it's, it should be allowed. There are decisions in my understanding. Okay. okay. Even there are decisions stating that if the SSC is paying any consideration. and getting the share of property under family settlement arrangement itself it's eligible i understand yeah so probably. considering the intent uh, it should be allowed it will sail through at least at judicial level i would say i tribunal or high court would say so okay there is one more question by jessie jeeva priya may I read this for her is a new subject she says my doubt is the sale consideration either actual or deemed speaks about guideline value or the market value is the term market value has anything to do with the income tax it is a guideline value or the market value is the question so where is it exactly is in chat box or uh... is the chat box just below the question of uh, nadrajan okay. jessi jeeva priya is the name of the person who has posed the question um dwarke this is the question put to me privately not in the public chat okay and it won't display it won't be available to you i'll read it once again okay my duty is the sale consideration is either actual or deemed 
speaks about guideline value or the market value she wants whether it is a guideline value or the market value that determines the sale consideration according to the for purpose of income tax act okay i would as written two folds i would say section 50c is also a deeming provision 50ca is also a deeming provision let me address okay. 50c first which is yes, to transfer of immovable property yes sir okay so sir, as, as far as section 50c is concerned it refers only to stamp duty value hmm. the unfortunate part is for assessment year 16 17 and 17 18 in lot of assessments we are finding it difficult because stamp duty value in chennai it was substantially higher and in the subsequent assessment year it was slashed by one third by the government itself oh so our a lot of our clients have sold properties uh, at prevailing market value but mm. the department initiated proceeding under section 50c as a attributed deemed consideration oh. so we have this issue and uh, unfortunately our hands are tied from filing writ also i would say since we have alternate remedy of filing appeal so we have to go in the normal path and uh, reach high court after a few years i would say <laughs> so it's only stamp duty value for the purpose of 50c which is uh, okay 50ca talks about uh, shares valuation share valuation so as far as section 50ca is concerned it refers to a rule called rule 11 ua mm. as per rule 11 ua how we need to value is all assets we have to value at net book value if there is any immovable property we have to value at uh, current stamp duty value if there is any share sitting in the balance sheet we have to value that share in the manner provided in rule 11 ua again 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 11 ua exactly yeah. if there is any investment in the company that investment should come across uh, the 11 ua process oh, yeah. as okay. reduced by the net liabilities except few the detailed uh, mechanism i am just giving the birds eye view so that yes. is how this uh, share valuation reads okay sir and there is one mr sentil kumar as uh, judge has pointed out he has given an indication or answer or clue for his question of nadarajan he says for developer share it's his stock in trade so any profit or loss is his business income is it so mr dwarakesh yes sir so i will answer in two folds i would say uh, in my uh, in my humble view the practical view would be yes if uh, developers it would be part of stock in trade in such a cases assessee will adopt a view that it is taxable only in the year of sale of uh, asset not in the year of obtaining certificate of completion because 45 5a is only in the context of capital gain not in the context of business income if it is considered as stock in trade uh, stock in trade has to be accounted only at the cost only for the land owner uh, the cost is nothing but uh, the investment in land so this is from land owner's perspective for uh, developers it's in the year of sale only share its stock in trade any profit okay for developer means for developer it will be taxable in the year of actual sale actual. for land owner yes yes for developer no doubt at all but in actual sale what you will get the consideration itself no doubt for him it's a business income for the developer in the year of actual sale or uh, they have accounting standard 7 in accordance with to, uh, with that uh, it has to be computed on a proportionate basis in accordance with accounting standard 7 that is from uh, builders perspective as far as uh, land owner is concerned uh, land owner as he can take a view that it is taxable only in the year of uh, actual sale till then the cost will be the cost of investment in land for him the land has become uh, prop, uh, the what to say saleable flats in the year of saleable flats he can account as business income 45 5a cannot be applied to business assets is my humble view and my limited understanding that's fine sir i think you have answered the questions well and mr nadarajan wants to say something mr nadarajan yeah good evening to the lord chief and mr dwarakesh it was a very useful session in the short term of 2 uh, hours you have talked so much about the capital gains taxation which will be actually in our memory for a long term short term capital gain and long term capital gain and uh, without spending any revenue from our pocket we have gained a lot of knowledge and we have capitalized that knowledge and it will never be depreciated so we are all benefited by this two hour session and a very uh, difficult topic of course a lot of content is there in fact that land owner query still i have lot of doubts on that probably yeah on some other occasion we can discuss that so thank you thank you for both the speakers sir it was a very wonderful and a useful session not all sir hope there yes, was sir. neither evasion nor avoidance <laughs> <laughs> so i may request uh, once again uh, judge to offer his concluding remarks it has been a very enlightening session and uh, once again to shrinivas raghavan and to hemalata 
uh, congratulations on organizing such a wonderful uh, session. See, the sort of uh, exchanges, it uh, goes beyond uh, all uh, uh, the normal concept of an argument in a court or uh, sitting down in a consultation with the client. Here, that is a free and frank uh, exchange of views. I cut across uh, the various uh, participants here. And providing such a platform calls uh, not only for a good forward thinking on part of uh, both of you, but uh, it also is uh, deeply appreciated. And uh, personally, for me, it has been a good experience. And I'm uh, grateful to Mr. Dwarakesh for also having accepted and for uh, participating and uh, giving such valuable uh, inputs to all the participants here. It's my pleasure, sir. It's my pleasure to be part of the panel. All in all, I think uh, uh, we've done uh, as good as we could, uh, taking into consideration the uh, technical subject and the difficulty of the topic involved. To a little extent. But uh, of course, the final judgment has to be given by the participants and, <laughs> of, the, and by the host of the meeting. So Mr. Srinivas Raghavan and Ms. Hemdata, I think uh, you should pass your comments. I, th I, th I may request uh, Mr. Y.P. Srinivas before that to uh, conclude by saying a word of thanks um, as a matter of uh, formality. I do. Mr. Srinivas, please, from Pantos Tax Law. Thanks to Unnan Dar and to Harbour Jets and others also. Uh, it was a wonderful session today, very informative and enlightening session. Both the speakers complimented each other. And it's a uh, it's our fortunate uh, honorable judges uh, chosen to address on this topic. It's uh, one of the major heads of income under the Income Tax Act, where the income arises on account of capital gain. So it's our fortunate to have chosen this topic. And uh, Mr. Srinivas Raghavan, the expert in our series, asked us to join also in this program. This is our second joint session, I have to mention. Yes. So on the yes, 68th sir. webinar of Lex webinar series, and. 124th webinar of Madras Tax Law. We are regularly conducting mostly on tax subjects. And uh, Evalots have chosen to address an income tax topic. But, and we also largely participate to today. Evalots have thoroughly explained the capital gain on all aspects. What all are the assets to be taxed and what all are the exemptions, particularly with reference to land and other things. And the chartered opponent also explained the reference to the various judgments and all. And in the discussion session, you each of you complimented each other and you made it as a nice interactive session. There was a large uh, questions emanating from the four participants and your large uh, took personal uh, initiative and uh, as a, as a joyful <laughs> lecturer. It's like a, a, a good teacher will get joy from the uh, intelligent questions asked to, from the students. So you are not seeing one and here there is a one question, one question to answer that. So it was a very informative, sir. You made it as an interactive session. We all thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, almost even to non-tax lawyers, this session was very useful. Everyone would have understood by this time what is capital gain and what all are the taxes uh, emanating from this. In fact, Mr. Srinivasra is saying <laughs> nice words, <laughs> tax avoidance, tax something. And uh, to each, uh, he is offering comments to each and everybody. It was a very nice uh, session, sir. We immensely thanks uh, Honorable Justice and uh, the chartered opponent and uh, for organizing this giant session by Lex Webinar at Madras Tax Bar. And once again, thanks to one and all. Thank you, Lord. Uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Srinivas, uh, Mr. Yes. Bhaskar wants to offer a comment. May I invite him? Ah, yes. Mr. Bhaskar? Yes, sir. Yeah, welcome, sir. Good evening, my lord, and uh, good evening, Dwarakesh. Very good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening. Uh, two things I wanted to say. You are uh, saying that you have been fighting with this guidelines value in most of the assessments for assessment years 15, 16, 16, 17 and all. Last yes. week, uh, I had one case before the tax bench. There, the issue again was this uh, guidelines value. Fortunately, in my case, the guidelines value that was adopted by the assessing officer was slashed by one third with the from 1 6 2017, as you are aware. <laughs> yes. But then the commissioner, commissioner wanted to go by the previous value and the past order, uh, 263 order. Then the tribunal said, in view of the fact that the government itself had with the from 1 6 2017, 
reduce the values goes to show that this is the market value and tribunal cancel the 263 order the tribunal mm-hmm. order has now been affirmed by the tax bank that is a happy news to share with all your chartered accountants because much of the problem will be solved with that i think uh, hamalata appeared uh, for the department <laughs> 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 that is she passed the mark on you <laughs> thank you sir thank you very much thank you mr thank you thank you so before concluding i just want to say only one thing uh, the section it was not taxing it was rather gaining <laughs> so i should uh, thank um, justice cv kartikeyan for his um, thoughtful uh, suggestion of this topic actually we were deliberating on more topics instead of this one but this topic which has been chosen proves to be a very interesting one because it applies to all the person whether they pay the tax or practice tax or something so it proves to be a very very interactive and lively section and the choice of dwarakesh added a flavor and i thank both of them for having spent their valuable time and i thank the madras tax court for their contribution and their support with this word i may just sign off and by thanking once again thank you once again thank you thank you everyone thank you very much thank you thank you been a pleasure thank you yeah